I'm Tim Humphrey. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's two minutes past eight on LBC. Welcome to Cross Question, LBC's weekly political panel debate show. Or is it weekly? We might have a little announcement on that a little later. Coming up, uh, we are going to be in the company of Dame Angela Eagle, Labour MP for Wallasey, for a member of the Treasury Select Committee. India Willoughby, broadcaster, journalist and reality TV personality. And Didi Okazi, who's Chief Executive of UK Youth. And Lee Rowley, who's Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party and Conservative MP for North East Derbyshire. You can, of course, watch us on Global Player, on the LBC YouTube channel, Facebook feed and Twitter feed. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And of course, if you'd like to ask our panel a question, the number 0345 973 Well, welcome to you all. Let's crack on with our first question. It comes from Julie in my hometown of Tunbridge Wells. Hello, Julie. Hi. Hi, Ian. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Um, so I'm a self-employed travel agent um, and I've been refunding and rebooking my customers since April 2020 and I've not earned any salary at all in that time um, since travel stopped. I'd just like to ask the panel, do they think that um, the government are sending mixed messages um, at the moment um, around the traffic light system for international travel? Uh, Lee Rowley, let's come to you first. I don't think it's mixed messages. I think it's a recognition that we're in a fluid period of time and we're trying to reopen elements of what we all want to do as quickly as possible. We want to get back to normal, whether that's in our daily lives or going on holiday. But it is just a challenge to do that at the moment. And so what we've tried to do is move away from just a full ban on travel other than for exceptional circumstances, which was in place for the last few months, to trying to get to a place where you know, there is a gradation, there are countries which can now be visited to allow people to do that should they wish, but also recognising that there are still a large number of countries around the world where it's not really appropriate to do so other than an emergency. And I realise that causes significant issues and huge issues, particularly in your industry, and I'm very sorry for that. But at the moment, it's a reflection of the very flu fluid situation on the ground. And I think that's going to be the case for a little while yet, unfortunately. But it, it, isn't it incumbent on government ministers to actually sing from the same hymn sheet here? We've, we, we've had George Eustace, we've had Boris Johnson, we've had Matt Hancock, we've had Simon Hart, all giving totally different interpretations of what the word amber means. That cannot go on. The government has a clear um, statement on the website, which is uh, advises against... Well, why, do, why don't government ministers actually read their own website then? Well, they do. I mean, that, that, that we advise against all non-essential travel to amber and red list countries. But then you inevitably get into this discussion about what does that mean in this circumstance or that scenario? And there are as many scenarios as there are often people who may are, are actually travelling or may want to travel. And you have to pull back at some point and say, look, the government's trying to create a framework around here to make sure that there is the ability to travel in certain circumstances. We trust in people's ability to make those decisions and make those determinations within those guidelines and people will have to draw, make their own conclusions but the statement is really clear no non-essential travel to amber and red list countries well, unless and until there is the review which will happen once every two to three weeks Lee, I have, a, I have a rule in life that whenever a politician says this is very clear, it's usually a good indication that it's far from clear. And I, I'm not, you must understand surely that if Simon Hart goes on the radio uh, and says, well, of course, people think that going on holiday is an emergency for them. And then Matt Hancock says something different. And then Boris Johnson says something different. And George Eustace says something different. You've got to surely admit that the message is a little bit blurred, even if it's been clarified today. 
this is what we've had at points over the last year where you know in a period where there are a lot of rules and a lot of regulations and a lot of legislation something that myself as a conservative is not very keen on because you get into these kind of arbitrary discussions but we've accepted that it's necessary for a temporary period of time as a result of coronavirus you have all of these very challenging questions and ultimately as i say there are as many scenarios as there are people thinking through doing this whether it's holidays in this instance or something else else when the rules were different on some other element of daily life and we get that it's difficult and one of the reasons why it is so challenging is because all of these different layers of rules and regulations cause cause challenge people to interpret them but we hope that when people pull back and stand back they recognize that it's relatively clear that no non-essential travel to amber and red list countries means don't go unless you have to. Angela you're shaking your head I can I can sense you're keen to get in. I think we've had nothing but confusion from government ministers and I think if, if things were clear then you would have expected that all the government ministers that were on media rounds and expecting to be interviewed would have the same story and would have got the story straight so they could explain it to everybody else. I think the vast majority of people in this country want to do the right thing, they want to stick by the rules, they want to be as safe as possible. There's also a great yearning to get to the sun and have some kind of break after a year and a half of lockdown and all the worries and 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 the stresses that the coronavirus pandemic has caused so the minimum the government could have done was get its story straight and i think the government really uh, is is caught between two stools and it has been right since the beginning of this pandemic they want to basically say it's up to you what you do and and leave people to make their own decisions because of the libertarian bent that there is in the government but when you've got a pandemic is, that, a is pandemic, that a bad thing to have trust in people surely that's no, no, a good no, thing to, to trust people to do the right thing of course not but when you have an infectious pandemic uh, where some people who spread it might not get it themselves but may spread it and kill other people there are some public health issues that you have to deal with and i think the government have struggled with that basic problem right from the beginning and many tens of thousands of people have died because of it i think by the end what they really need after a year and a half of this to get the story straight be clear say that there might be some changes at the last minute if situations change but the minimum they could do is tell us what green means what amber means and what red means they couldn't put india on the red list uh, for 14 days because it was inconvenient to boris johnson we've had 110 airplanes arrive from direct from India since the variant. We know that 5% of people have tested positive for the Indian variant. It's now spreading across the country in 80 local authorities because they can't get their approach right. I think the vast majority of people in this country would follow the rules if they knew what they were. Okay. Um, India, I'm going to take you off the red list for, for now. Um, Thank what, you. What, what, <laughs> what? <laughs> what what do, what do you think of the of what the government have done here? Because when in a, in this kind of crisis, and it still is a crisis, it, I guess it is difficult for a government to get things right all the time. But Keir Starmer's message at Prime Minister's questions today, I guess, was well, um, people need a clear message, otherwise they they won't they won't know what to do. What, where do you fall on this? Yes, well, first of all, Ian, um, my greatest sympathies to Julie, the travel agent because uh, what a disastrous communication campaign this has been. You would think Gerald Ratner was in charge of comms, the mixed messages. I've heard four different versions today of what Amber means, and I think Amber is the problem. It's all very well saying, you know, we, we're going to trust people to use their common sense and make their own decisions, but governments are elected to lead. And when you have that middle area, it's just causing confusion. So if it was me in charge of government, I would just simply have a red where you cannot go or a green where you can go. And clarity is going to be the key. Then you can carry on. But at the moment, this amber um, element is just causing too much confusion, confusion for everybody, both the travel industry, the general public, and uh, ministers themselves, it would seem. And Didi Okazi, what does amber mean to you? Because I think it, I think it means different things to different people. If you look at the highway code, it does mean stop. But I suspect many people interpret it as get set. Mm. 
I, I really think we sometimes underestimate how little the general public follow all of these sound bites and conversations that happen. Um, I think it's it's been a really interesting year just to watch the way that our government works in terms of, I don't honestly think I really am struck by Angela's reflections, but the reality is there's nothing the government would have done that wouldn't, there wouldn't have been some kind of challenge to or something that's just the way that we're built um, as a society. There's like, there's got to be an opposition somewhere. I think the reality is this still continues to be a really important, significant um, um, period for people. I think Julie's point is really what we should focus on. Um, I understand Amber to be allowed versus advised to do. I, I, I honestly don't understand the confusion of that. I think if there, if there wasn't um, and Amber, there would have been challenge around why is there just a red and a green. I think the reality of the, the pandemic is I'm not really sure there's any path that could have been taken that somebody would not find opposition to. And really, I think that it is um, in, um, important for ministers particularly to be repeating the same messages but let's not cloud that with the notion that the message itself could have been perfect there is nothing we could have done throughout this past year that you would get widespread consensus on and so the reality is that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are people like Julie there are people who are trying to navigate their way through this pandemic and let's not get lost in the lull of just enjoying the debate and the distraction if that makes sense um, just a final word from you, Lee, on this. Um, it's said that, I don't know where this figure comes from, but five million people have booked trips to amber classified countries. That could be catastrophic, could it not, if, if that figure is true? If they, if they they come back, who knows who they've mixed with, if, if maybe 20% of them don't obey the quarantine rules when they come back, that, that could put us back a long way. Well, I haven't seen that figure and I, you know, I, I would just caution people to be very careful over the coming month. It is it is a challenge, I accept, and it is absolutely right about the particular challenge in the travel industry. Um, but, you know, we, we all would like to get away. Angela's absolutely right. We'd all like to get away in the summer. But at the moment, you know, there is a real challenge around it. We wish it wasn't the case. We hope that more can move onto the green list in the coming months. I presume a lot of the people you're referencing are, are, are booking on the basis of hoping that's the case. Um, let's hope that we get there and, you know, that the, the data still is moving in the right direction. But at the moment, there is clarity. Don't travel to Amber okay. or Redland is anything other than non-essential reasons. Um, let's go back to our caller, Julie, in Tunbridge Wells. Ca can you kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel now for your business, Julie? Or do you still think things are really uncertain and up in the air? You don't know whether the June 21st uh, easing is going to continue. Mm, I mean, I think it is clearer, amazingly, than it was in 2020 when it was just chaos. Um, but I just, I just do think that the amber is a bit of an issue um, because if people can't travel to the amber, then why is, why, why isn't it just red? Um, so I think that would be a lot easier. And obviously, if the government ministers did stop contradicting each other, that would really help because. Obviously, customers listen to all the different media outlets. They watch the TV, they listen to the radio, and they have no idea what, you know, whether they can go, if they can't go, or what it all means. It's just a bit of a minefield. I do think that later this year it is going to get better. They will, there will be a way through it. There is a way through it. I've got customers going to Madeira, Portugal in the next few weeks. So, you know, there, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but it, it, the tunnel might be a bit longer than we um, thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck to you, Julie. Thank you very much indeed for calling in. The number to call if you'd like to put a question to our panel, 0345 6060 973. Cross question. Let's go to our next caller. It's Chris in Richmond. Hello, Chris. Hello there. Hello, panel. Um, my question is, has the government been asleep at the wheel when it comes to managing the spread of the uh, Indian variant of COVID? Indeed, you're crazy. I don't believe so. I think that the the again, I just I find this whole period we, we, we've been in a global pandemic. I think that the process around managing it um, remains complicated. I think people are um, really keen to get back and out, and you know, in terms of getting on with their lives. And one of the things I know that the 
government have reinforced quite often is the notion that they don't want you know every step needs to be irreversible so i believe that um you know the kind of the, the focusing on surge testing and um um trying to ensure that people are vaccinated in that community seems inherently sensible um i do think we are underestimating um the how difficult it's going to be to pull back once and if we have to. Um, so I, I, I really do feel confident that they are doing what they're meant to be doing in this. But I think the reality is we are dealing with an unknown enemy, as it were. I mean, hindsight is always easy in these circumstances, but a lot of people were saying many, many weeks ago, uh, why don't you put India on the red list? And they didn't. And, I mean, people would draw the conclusion that the, the reason that this Indian variant is now getting traction in this country is for that reason. But that, but that, I guess that's the exact point. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and I think that, I mean, it, it, there are lots of things. I'm sure with all of the reviews, we're going to be able to say, and uh, hands down, I think if government are in any way suggesting that they've been perfect through all this, you know, that would be laughable. But the reality is, I'm, pre you know, I'm pretty sure there were um, lots of various conversations that happened at the point, and the decision was made not to take it, you know, not to put it on the list at that time. I don't know that doing so would have prevented what we've seen, because again, we've seen examples of it over the last year as well so i think the reality is how do we deal with something when it occurs and are we equipped to ensure that we're not repeating the same mistakes over and over again india willoughby yeah well i do think they've been slow out the blocks i mean last month boris had to cancel his uh trip to the, the for the trade talks to india because of concerns of covid over there and they have known for weeks that there's a serious problem. So yes, once again, slow out the box, but this is symptomatic of the whole handling of the crisis um, from the very start. They've been caught between a rock and a hard place. They're a rabbit in the headlights and they don't know what to do. And my take on it, Ian, is that they're actually looking to the future here. And they're well aware that there are going to be lots of inquiries on various aspects from the actual handling of the pandemic itself onto the, um, the issuing of contracts for uh, protective gear. All of that's gonna, gonna come further down the line and that they want to be able to look back and say, oh, well, we said this, we didn't do that. They're actually saying two things at the same time on everything there is yeah, a lack if, of if you if you if you're right surely um that they wouldn't they would have adopted a safety first policy and they would have locked down everything to do with india right from the beginning well well, well no i i take the opposite view i think they're keeping it they're trying to keep they're, they're actually keeping things loose but the rhetoric the statements that are coming out as we've heard today are contradictory some are hard some are soft and that covers all the bases. So further down the line, they'll, for, they'll forget about the stance that proves to be incorrect and they will point to the statements that were correct. They're saying two things at once, but definitely slow out the blocks and they've acted way too slow. Okay. They knew about the India variant. Angela Eagle, do you think they've been asleep at the wheel on this? I think they've been very slow off the blocks right from the beginning of the pandemic. And there may have been a reason for the complacency at the beginning, although I think it put people's lives at risk, but there's no reason for them to be making the same mistakes over and over again, always to be behind the curve in terms of where the pandemic is. We've known that variants are a, a problem. They put Pakistan and Bangladesh on the red list uh, because of the Indian variant, but not India. Was it a, a bit until 15 days later? Was it a coincidence that that was because Boris Johnson wanted to visit India and see Absolutely. India and, to, and and actually um, have a big have a big post Brexit trade talk? I suspect it was, um, and he has to explain why Bangladesh and Pakistan, which had much lower levels of the Indian variant, went on the red list much earlier than India itself. Um, Prime Minister Modi has been incredibly complacent about the spread of the Indian variant across his country, allowing sporting events, the general election, big religious festivals, and now untold thousands of people who could have been saved are dying in India. We are now the country which got, has got the largest 
infection rate of the Indian variant uh, outside of India itself. Um, since India went on the red list, we've we've now got. Uh, 110 flights that have come in directly. We know from testing that 5% of the people that come in are infected with the Indian variant. Uh, there's no surprise that given uh, that the quarantine's not working properly, that we've now got 80 local authority areas that have got community spread of the Indian variant and one in five of the infections of COVID in this country now are the Indian variant. Now, it may be that the Indian variant is going to be uh, dominant, as Chris Whitty said. It may be that we have to hope that the Indian variant will not escape the vaccines like the South African one uh, may have done. But this is all risks that didn't have to be taken if there'd have okay. been faster, more resolute action from the government. Um, Lee Rowley, obviously you're not going to say the government was asleep at the wheel, I get, I get that, but what, I mean, Angela there said that this country has more cases of the Indian variant than any other country outside the in India and the, and the surrounding countries. What do you put that down to? Well, one of the reasons is that we have such good genomic sequencing. We are we absolutely lead the world in making sure we understand as quickly as possible what is going on with different with coronavirus and the different types of variants. So it is going to be that things show up in the UK first because we do an awful lot of focus on that, unlike other countries elsewhere in the world. But you know, I think to some extent Angela is arguing with a virus. India is arguing with a virus. You unless you are going to perpetually close your country down and never let anybody in, which some countries are doing, you know, Australia is trying that, still has a small amount of coronavirus, but unless you're going to do that, and we can't do that because 75% of our food supplies come in from an integrated European supply chain, a substantial proportion of our medicines, you have to accept that the variants will move around the world and that they will come here eventually. And so the que in the same way that the Kent variant got out of the UK and went all around the world, despite everybody else's attempt to keep it out from the UK. So the focus of the government it should be on trying to mitigate and manage that, which is exactly what we're doing by boosting vaccinations, by putting surge testing in. And yes, I'd like to have kept it out. But in the same way, I'd never like, I never wanted coronavirus to come here in the first place. But the first recorded case of the Indian variant in the UK, I think was on the 22nd of February. So all this discussion, which Andy, Angela and India have just been pointing out, was March and April. It was already here. They're arguing with the Yeah, but the, po but the Andrew, point is, the, 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 the point is that uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh were put on the red list and India wasn't. And had it been, it is, it is surely arguable that a lot of these cases would not have arrived in this country. And, and as I understand at the time, the testing rates of people coming back from Pakistan and Bangladesh have three times the positivity rates of India. And what this demonstrates is that ultimately this thing moves very fast that we have much better systems and processes than we did this time last year or even this time last winter. But still we are trying to deal with a highly contagious virus and we're having to do that very delicate and difficult balance between trying to allow as much of normal life to go on as possible whilst trying to protect people and we have we have closed down direct flights to India, we have installed hotel quarantine, right. we have put um, ways in which we can resolve, try to bear down on this on this on this variant getting out around the country, but it was impossible to stop it coming here. Just like I'm afraid it will be impossible to stop another variant coming to us in the future and us exporting other variants in the future as well. The important thing is we deal with them quickly. Okay, like and they're here. Well, Angela, I, I, you, Angela, I, you want yeah. to come back? I, I just think that um, on the precautionary principle, instead of accepting that all variants are always going to get everywhere, we need to give ourselves a bit of time to test whether they escape the vaccines. Because if we got a variant that completely escaped the vaccines, we'd be back where we were in March 2020. And so let's use our science. Let's be able to have a look at the genomes. Let's check and test whether new variants that emerge in the world actually are a threat like that before we're so complacent about letting them into the country. There's nothing wrong with having a bit more of a precautionary principle about this, rather than arguing, as Lee seems to be, that we should let all variants rip everywhere and just hope the scientists all... all, all, all well, to, be fair, he was, to be fair, he wasn't arguing that. Uh, NDD. 
But that's that's not what he said at all. And I guess this is the point about being able to have a proper conversation without it becoming a political um, um, tennis match. The reality, the thing that strikes me in all of this debate is that there are there are just as many people who are furious that the government didn't act quickly enough as there are people who thought that we acted too quickly because their businesses were affected and that you know their livelihoods were locked down in so many instances, whether it's travel or not. And so the reality in, in this is that I just think we're dealing with a beast that there is no scenario in which there is any path that well that, that uh, may that may be right but your argument surely if, if you follow it to its logical extent would be never to question what the government has done because no, not at all. Um, there will be some not people at all. who say they did it too quickly and some people who said they were too no, slow what i'm saying is that let's not get stuck into the notion that there is a beautiful solution that everybody would be um, happy with. difficult decisions have to be made and that is the role of the government and okay. again i am not here to and you know, defend the government Saying there's a perfect but, solution uh, and the, nobody's saying there's a perfect solution but i think this government have consistently been behind the curve and they haven't learned from errors that they made in the earlier stages of lockdown and they've kept on making the same mistakes over and over again and I think that's if, a real if, shame. You, if you go through what you are suggesting which was we go with the precautionary principle this thing was here on the 22nd of february i don't even think it had been identified as what it was in india on the 22nd of february so your natural conclusion is that you close down the uk for all travel for good for a period of months until you work out what's happening and then you do it again and you do it again and you do it again and we'll never get out of it okay right it's Let unreasonable to do what you're suggesting Let's go back to our caller, Chris, in Richmond. Um, what's your answer to your own question? Well, yes, they have been asleep at the wheel. Lee, I'm sorry you're gaslighting people. Um, in terms of the comparisons within Pakistan and Bangladesh and India, go to BBC Fact Tech right now and you'll, uh, you'll find that what Matt Hancock said in the Commons the other day is factually incorrect and what you stated is factually incorrect in terms of the positivity rate. So that's a lie. Secondly, I came back from Argentina where there was 2,500 cases per day in January and I flew back by Madrid and I had to stay at home. For 10 days so why why india was not put on the red list back in the beginning of april at, the le at least is unfathomable and allowing direct flights to continue is just insane frankly I, I think the government has been completely reprehensible in the way it's managed it and excuses lee are, are, are pathetic frankly the government has not learned and angela is exactly right on this Okay, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have more of your questions to our panel in a moment. 0345 60609. It's 835 on LBC. Um, well, one of our Twitter followers has stolen my thunder a bit. John Gittins on Twitter says, should cross-question be more than once a week? Well, I'm here to tell you that from next week, cross-question will be on three times a week at 8 o'clock on Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We've had such brilliant feedback from you since we restarted it in March, because obviously uh, over lockdown down uh, we, we didn't do it because i couldn't really host it from my bedroom but um robbie uh, has put together some fantastic panels he's my producer over the past few weeks and we've had a lot of people say can you do it a bit more often so that's what we're going to do from next week and if i tell you our first panel on monday consists of diane abbott the former shadow home secretary sarah vine the male columnist polly toynbee the guardian columnist and the cabinet minister brandon lewis that's the kind of quality that you're going to get used to but you're used to it tonight Tonight with our wonderful panel here, we have with us Dame Angela Eagle, Labour MP for Wallasey, and she's a member of the Treasury Select Committee, India Willoughby, broadcaster, journalist and reality TV personality, and Didi Okazi, who's Chief Executive of UK Youth, and Lee Rowley, who's Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party and Conservative MP for North East Derbyshire. I'm going to go to a text question next. Mary in Southampton asks, I'm a nurse in A&E, and we're seeing a growing number of children attending hospital after self-harming. Is the government doing enough to support young people's mental health um well we marked mental health week last week and this is a subject that is comes up increasingly often i find on the program um and didi okazi you're chief executive of uk youth um i'm going to come to you first again on this just explain in 20 seconds what uk youth is <laughs> Great. Um, UK Youth is a national charity. Um, so we have around 8,000 youth organisations across the UK. We work with nation partners in other parts of the UK as well. Um, and it's primarily focused on organisations and work that support young people through youth work. So thinking about the development of young people, skills development, personal development, character development. So to, to go directly to the question, I think one of the things that's really happened over the last year is that the 
the inequity of experience and um, um, opportunities for young people, I think, has become much more clear for lots of people. Um, and when you think about the reality for lots of young people in terms of the um, opportunities they have in their home, the fact that their homes may not feel safe, the fact that for so many young people interacting with each other is an incredibly critical part of their development, we, I guess, could even begin to start understanding why mental health issues have become so pr um, prominent. Um, and I think the reality is that the government um, definitely needs to do more on this. I think we all need to do more. I think this is one of those things where the language around mental health needs to be reinforced. We, what's our understanding? of mental health issues and how do we start speaking to it in a way that takes away the stigma and really ensures that young people have the kind of support they need all the way through and, and in every environment that they may be. So I definitely think that there's been a step change in awareness around this, but I really believe it has to, it's just at the beginning of what it needs to be. Um, Angela Eagle, let me come to, to you next. I'm actually going to ask all three of you to keep your remarks fairly brief on this so we can squeeze in um, an extra question. Um, do you think that, look, everybody's going to say more needs to be done, but how do we quantify that? What, what one thing would you like to see government do to uh, support young people's mental health? Well, we need to try and shift uh, the services to much more prevention and have a much more holistic approach to mental health in general. It's, it's the case for young people, obviously, but also others. Um, we, we don't deal with crisis very well. Youth services are not statutory and therefore they've borne the brunt of cuts over the last 11 years. That makes it harder. Increasingly, in my own constituency, I see that when people are in crisis, whatever age they are, um, the systems and the support really isn't there. The waiting lists are too long. Uh, and so in, until it gets really acute, it's almost impossible to get treatment or talking therapies. Uh, and that is before the effects of the pandemic. The lockdowns have had a tremendously difficult effect for very, very many people. There are a lot of people who've been very isolated and felt uh, alone. A good thing is that people now talk about it a lot more and some of my colleagues in the House of Commons have made some very brave speeches about their own struggles with mental health. That all helps to take away the stigma, but we've got a very, very long way to go. Lee Rowley, um, oh, Angela is right that this is a subject that we talk a lot about now in the media and politics much more than we did five or ten years ago maybe. But um, looking at the support services that there are in your constituency, how would you like to see them improved? Well, uh, I mean, I'd like to see some of the waiting list times come down as well and we recognise that there is absolutely more work to be done on that it's I mean Angela will have had the same experience as I have and I, you know I'm sure the whole panel will have done it, will have done in some way shape or form you know when you get the call from a from a resident of your constituency who says my my daughter or my son is really really struggling and we've tried to access services at school we've tried to work out ways in which cams will work the the child and adult mental health service it, it, it is a real challenge and there are thousands of dedicated people working across North Derbyshire and across the country to try and help and there's a lot more money gone into this there's a lot more commitment that has gone into this parity of mental and physical health but th this is a long journey which has started a number of years ago and is going to take a number of years yet but just like the other panelists uh, you know we do have to do more here there is a recognition on the part of the government that there is more to do and i support that recognition um india you've written a lot about this subject um, what, it, what it, what's your answer to uh, mary's question yeah, well, well I, I've got a, a great deal of sympathy for, for young people. I think they're very much the, um, the forgotten sector of society in this. You know, we hear about mental health, people at, at work, of working age, uh, and the elderly. But I think in the future, we are going to pick up the receipts for what is happening now. The fact that children have missed out, not just on education, a physical education with a teacher in the classroom, but also the social side, the interaction and developing those skills. Um, and I know you're conscious of time. Just, just going forward, I would like to, to see things such as youth clubs be reintroduced. I think it's, a, it's just as important, probably more so, to concentrate on the social side because we want good citizens um, coming through and that's the area that i would be looking at 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Let's go to our next caller. It's Mosha in Boreham Wood. Hello, Mosha. Hi, and good evening. Thanks for taking my call, and uh, good evening to you, the, uh, the panel. I want you to know something. Um, you know, in 2005, when the uh, <clears throat> when the Israelis gave back the uh, Gaza Strip to the Palestinian Authority to take control of and to rule once again, uh, you know, until that point, there was relative peace, and then all of a sudden, 2007 comes along, Hamas takes over with a military coup, and then things really flare up. Now there's all of a sudden calls for peace. You know, we must get around the table with Hamas, must must talk to them, uh, and, and 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 flesh out a, a peace treaty. My question is simple: Do you see an everlasting peace between Hamas? Well, or should we say the Gaza Strip? Well, Hamas is. It, oh, under control, uh, under control of it, and Israel. Or well, I mean, what's your take? Do you, do you so, see an everlasting peace? So effectively, is a lasting peace possible uh, while Hamas, Hamas remains uh, in control uh, of Gaza? Hamas is under, absolutely. Well, okay, Hamas is fine. Under control. Yeah. Uh, uh, Angela Regal. Well, I think the tragedy of what's gone on over time in the Middle East and the horrific scenes that we've been seeing in the last few weeks, the children being murdered, the <laughs> bombing of civilians, the, uh, the, the, the fact that civilians on both sides are targeted, uh, is really about uh, the fact that those that tried to make peace many years ago were assassinated by the extremists on their own side, if you think of Sadat, if you think of Rabin, and that what's happened in the absence of a peace process directed, uh, as it had been in the past by uh, the US, uh, has been just the growth of extremism and violence, and that makes it harder and harder to see a way out. Without uh, there being bridges built between people who want a two-state solution and to see uh, two peoples living peacefully side by side, you get an escalation of this kind of violence. Uh, and, and there's no way of creating a peace process if there isn't reaching out. And if those who aren't on the extremist sides of both arguments um, are, aren't, uh, are in power, it's very, very difficult to see how that would work. So for Hamas, obviously, they don't recognise the right of Israel to exist. Well, um, not only that, they want to destroy it. Exactly. They don't recognise the right of Israel to exist. They're supported by other players in the Middle East. There's all sorts of proxy wars going on. But at the at the centre of it is the fact that those who tried to build bridges and make peace were assassinated by the extremists in their own camps. And now what you've got is no process, no uh, place to try to build a centre ground and more and more escalating violence and fear. And it's very, very difficult uh, without the intervention of um, uh, countries like America that might be able to broker um, some kind of process and de-escalate to see things getting any better. Um, Lee Rowley, it's interesting today, America and Russia has called on, uh, called for a, a ceasefire, but uh, Benjamin Netanyahu isn't having any of it. But going back to the question, do you think that there can ever be a peace whilst Hamas not just remains in control of Gaza, but has this clause about wanting to uh, destroy Israel and its constitution? I think it's already been highlighted how difficult that is when you have an organisation that want, that doesn't recognise the right of, of Israel to exist, who wants to drive the population of Israel into the sea, who fires rockets indiscriminately at civilian areas in Israel, and who isn't terribly good on a lot of the things that we take for granted in liberal Western democracies. There's a lot of people on this panel, including myself, who Hamas are not very keen on who they love. And, um, you know, that, that, is, that is something which it makes it extremely... I think that's the understatement of the week, isn't it, Lee? <laughs> and, you know, the, there wouldn't the, be many of us left, would there? <laughs> no, there really wouldn't. <laughs> and that is the challenge, isn't it, that you have an ex a very, very extreme organisation which took over 
um, the area it controls, not by democratic and peaceful methods, but by violence a number of years ago. At the same time, as responsible members of the international community, you have to sort of work out ways in which you can uh, try and de-escalate the situation. You can try and make people come around the table, but you have to do it on the basis of an acceptance um, that you know there is a t there needs to be a, a, a two-state solution. And that starts with the acceptance that one country does not need to be exterminated. <laughs> But when you have the Israeli ambassador who was sitting in this studio with me last Thursday effectively saying that she, she's not in favour of a two-state solution. I, I think that ship maybe has sailed. Um, India and NDD, I'm going to ask you to be relatively brief on this, on this one if I can. Uh, India, let's go to you first. Yeah, well, well, first of all, I think it's important that we make the distinction between the state of Israel and Jewish people generally because it doesn't all, always follow that um, every Jewish person supports what... Israel is doing. So I'm going to speak up a little bit for the Palestinians um, here, as we've heard a lot of pro-Israel uh, rhetoric. I mean, at the end of the day, the Palestinians were there first. They have been squeezed over a number of years. You, you now effectively have three pockets of Palestinian areas within Israel, you know, travel's restricted, they cannot vote. And I think when you get in that situation, when you're cornered and you are desperate, then bad things will happen. And at the end of the day, you know, Israel do have the might of the US supporting them, while Palestine don't. You know, they have very few friends. So while I'm not an expert on the subject, uh, my gut feeling is that the Palestinians do have a case to answer. I was listening to the Israeli ambassador to the UK, um, who was on your show just, just earlier today, uh, and she has all the charm of a hungry crocodile. I just cannot see a peace coming um, with, with the likes of her in charge. And, yeah, it's yeah, but what, what about Hamas? What about Hamas, though? I mean, give, given... Well, what their views, their, their stated views on Israel, and given some of their, should we say, uh, socially conservative views on, on many of the subjects that most of the people it, it, on this panel yeah. and indeed sitting in this presenter's chair hold dear, I find it incredible that people on the left seem to, seem to sympathise with Hamas to the extent that they do. Yeah, well, honestly, I'm definitely not on the left. I'm definitely more to the right. But um, I you, think... You've hidden it well, well tonight, India, if I may <laughs> say so. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but, but I think if Israel as well, if you look at the, the trajectory of what's happened over the decades, um, I would say that a lot of Palestinians would feel that the end game for the state of Israel is for there to be no Palestinians in Israel. So they're both saying the same things. But that means, this is that what I would all... say about the extremists. You've got to you've got to have some common ground if you can build bridges and then build a solution. It has been done in other um, conflicts. If you think about what happened with the the Good Friday Accords and peace uh, in in the island of Ireland, it can be done. Everything can be done with politics. That doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, and okay. when the extremists are winning on both sides, it makes it very, very difficult indeed to build enough trust to move forwards. And Didi, I'm going to ask for brevity because I'm six minutes late for a no, break. Fine. Um, and this literally just said the, the, what I was going to say in the sense that um, of course it ha we have to believe it can be done because I don't. Really, what is the alternative? Um, and uh, once again, we're in danger of, I guess you know, lose f losing sight of the fact that there are innocents and children and the civilians that are getting caught up um, whilst the rest of the world debates. So um, we have to believe that there can be a solution. Otherwise, what else is the alternative? Thank you very much indeed. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.54. Don't forget, Cross Question will return next Monday at 8 o'clock, Tuesday and Wednesday. We're going three days a week from next week. Now, India Willoughby, Angela Eagle, Ndidi Okazi and Lee Rowley still with me taking your calls. Let's go to Angela in Notting Hill. Angela, hi, what's your question, please? I would like to ask, given that that nurse resigned... What is Boris's response? What respect do you actually have for nurses? Because they actually put themselves on the line. They got some 1% pay rise, which is actually nothing in the big scheme of things. 
what do you intend to actually do for them? How are you going to show them respect? Because giving a clap on Thursdays or whatever it was, that's nothing. What do, will you tangibly do okay. for them? Well, this is on the back, obviously, of the, the nurse that helped treat Boris Johnson when he was in hospital suffering from COVID announced that she's quit the NHS. I think that was announced yesterday. Um, India Willoughby, let's start with you on this. Are NHS staff and nurses in particular given enough respect by the government? Um, I think they are given enough respect, but it's not respect they necessarily want. It's money, as uh, the callers just illustrated there. Um, you know, 1%, I think the inflation rate doubled between March and April to 1.5%. So that's already uh, a negative. It's been wiped out. But the, the really tough reality, and, and this applies to everybody, not just nurses, is that the pot is bare. Um, I've been listening to the news today and I've heard Labour cry that we're actually cutting uh, the amount of money we're sending abroad to health um, organisations in India, as we've mentioned, Uganda, etc. Um, and what is the priority? Obviously, if, if people are wanting money sent abroad to help foreign health services, well, that should go here. And while I have a lot of sympathy with nurses, and I don't know what the answer is in terms of, um, you know, realistically um, compensating them for the tremendous efforts and uh, ordeals that they've been through this year, the reality is that there isn't much money to go around. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there actually in the private sector that would be grateful of just a job and 1%, even if it is a negative at the moment. Angela Regal. Well, uh, before I was elected to Parliament, I used to help write the nurses and midwives pay claim. Uh, and uh, perhaps I wasn't successful enough um, at ensuring that they're paid enough money when I was doing that. Um, clapping isn't good enough. I noticed in France they gave nurses a 10% uh, rise. Um, I think that clapping doesn't pay the bills. Uh, we need to ensure that there aren't so many vacancies in the health service because that means that nurses uh, and, and those other um, professionals that work in the health service to keep it going have to work more and more. And I don't think we should underestimate the trauma that they've been through and the bravery that they've shown in going into work day in, day out and uh, dealing with a virus that we knew very little about at the beginning, except that it was killing very, very many people. Uh, and we have to find a way of recognising them that isn't just standing on our doorsteps and clapping. And I do think that in the extraordinary circumstances, uh, we should be looking at giving them a far more substantial pay rise uh, than they're getting. It's just as, uh, you know, we, we've just got to prize our public sector workers far more uh, than we have done to date. Remember, nearly 900 healthcare workers died of COVID-19, some of them very young indeed, before we even had a vaccine. Um, Lee Rowley, the politics of this are, are interesting, aren't they? Because, of course, in, in Scotland, nurses are, are getting, I think, a 4% pay rise. Mm. Um, in, in Wales, it's something similar. And the Independent Commission, I think, were recommending a 2.1% rise. In retrospect, would it have not been better just to accept the 2.1%, just, just to sort of uh, make people feel, well, it is a little bit above inflation? Um, that would have shown a lot more respect, wouldn't it? I mean, this whole debate is predicated on the idea that a decision has been made. A decision hasn't been made yet. We are still awaiting the response from the Pay Commission. And when it comes, hopefully in the next few weeks, it's not far away now, I don't think, um, we will. the government will review it. The whole point it, why it goes through that process is to make sure we take into account things like the number of people coming into the profession, the number of people leaving the profession, the morale in the profession, all of those really important things. And you know, the government will look at it when it comes. But India is right. There is a broader frame and challenge around government spending. We've just spent nearly £400 billion more than we expected to this time last year or just over this time last year the right thing to do because of coronavirus and we want to of course try and support those people who've worked in the front line whether it be in the hospitals or anywhere else as much as is possible but i think we just wait to see what comes from the commission the government will review it and then you know obviously we can have the debate and okay. discussion 
Um, Lee, Lee, Lee can, I, find... can I just mention no, that? No, in, in India, we're, we're really running out of time and I've got to okay. get Ndidi into this no as well. Sorry, apologies. I mean, just to say, I think it's a complete and utter missed opportunity. And I think, that, again, once again, all of the things that Angela just said, we knew about even before the pandemic. I think not just nurses, but porters and all the people that... <laughs> had to go out where we all had the luxury of going in. I think that it goes beyond respect. I think it's a pure and utter acknowledgement of the critical role that they played to keep this country moving. Um, and so I think we, I completely understand the whole people well, don't understand, but I'm sure there's a lot of complex city around the, the money, but I think we've shown that we find money for things that we prioritise. And I think this would have been a moment to really make a stand about who we prioritise um, and then why. Right, quick final text from Tracy in Orpington. The trailer for the Friends reunion is now out. My husband and I are very excited. What TV show would the panel like to bring back? I have to say, I've never watched a full episode of Friends. I just oh don't get it. I know, yeah. isn't that a terrible admission? Um, <laughs> Lee, what would you like to bring back? Well, not Friends. <laughs> are you all i'm out of here what's going on i, mean, I, I think i quite like the krypton factor to come back which is probably showing my age and if that's not possible <laughs> just finish motherland and we love that so another series as soon as possible please india big brother uh, well, I, well I'm, I'm a great lover of tv theme tunes so for me, me it would either be minder flashing blade or the double deckers I, I, I have created a Spotify playlist of about 100 TV theme tunes. You need oh, to download fantastic. it. I'm going to check um, that out, Ian. Uh, Angela. Fantastic. Um, I think anything, uh, the Royal Family or Dinner Ladies, because I was a fantastic, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Victoria Wood and Carolina Hearn, and both of them were comedy geniuses. Both of them yeah. died in the same year, and I still haven't got over it. <sighs> Indeed, I'm expecting big things from you here. <laughs> well, first of all, it would be friends. How dare you all? So the, the reunion <laughs> doesn't go far enough, so it would be friends. But if I had to pick something different, it may not be classic enough, but please bring the Queen's Gambit back. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Oh, great. It's it's a terrific choice. choice. Well, you, we're now back, OK? Very okay, good choice. Well, <laughs> my, my, my choice would be Crossroads. Oh. which just shows how old I am, doesn't it? Right, India Willoughby, Dame Angela Eagle, uh, and Didi Okazi, and Lee Reddy, thank you very much for joining us. If you missed any of the programme, you can catch it up uh, on the LBC YouTube channel or indeed the Cross Question podcast, which will be available from about midnight.